bought groceries at the Kauf grocery store, took our cattle and pigs to the Kauf locker plant, uh, marketed the uh, hogs to the Kauf marketing agency in South St. Paul, a row electric cooperative provided us the electricity, and we even had a 22 family member telephone cooperative. My dad and my uncle were uh, the alignment to take care of and uh, maintain that line during that period of time. Once I uh, graduated, or, or uh, left the farm, graduated, went to the University of Minnesota, I spent the rest of my working career with the uh, St. Paul Bank for Cooperatives, financing agricultural cooperatives throughout the U.S. I uh, left the bank in 1999, and since then I've been doing some consulting with uh, various organizations, but the last 10 years have been focused strictly on senior housing cooperatives. and got involved with senior housing cooperatives for the first time back in uh, 1991, when we worked to uh, form Homestead Housing Center, which was sponsored by organizations like Lava Lakes, the Senate, uh, Great River Energy, and we developed 17 senior housing cooperatives, 351 units in Minnesota, Iowa, Wisconsin, and uh, Missouri. Uh, and all but one of those are still operating uh, today. Uh, what we're talking about is uh, this type of an organization. This is 7,500 York. Uh, in Edina, Minnesota. This was the first cooperative of its type. Now there's thousands of housing cooperatives, but what we're talking about are housing cooperatives that are totally owned, controlled, governed by the seniors themselves. And they're age-restricted, 55 and open. Now a cooperative is a not-for-profit business entity that's owned and controlled by the people who use it. Bill mentioned this is a cooperative. Credit unions are cooperatives. We have rural electric cooperatives here in Montana, farm supply, grain, uh, grain cooperatives. This is a housing cooperative, a cooperative where people actually live in their organization. The cooperative owns the land, it owns the building, it owns all the common areas in the building, and we got a feedback problem here. Uh, in addition, it also uh, uh, owns the flooring, appliances, and window treatments in all of the units. Members buy a share in the cooperative. They become an owner in the cooperative. And that share entitles them to live in a specific unit. As part of that, they have governance rights, they have participation rights in the governance operation of the cooperative. Uh, every share has one vote. Uh, and they elect the board of directors to govern and oversee the cooperative, and they pay a monthly fee or a monthly charge as part of living there. And we're going to talk about each of these a little more as we go through the uh, process. 7500 York opened in 1978, first cooperative of its type, 318 units, and now after uh, almost 37 years, we have 104 senior housing cooperatives with about 6,600 units and about 9,500 seniors living in those buildings. Now, 104 cooperatives is kind of impressive. Uh, 95 seniors is somewhat impressive, but when you think about Minnesota and Iowa combined, have one and a half million seniors over age 65, and we only have 9,500 living in senior housing cooperatives. There's a tremendous uh, market area there yet. As I said, most of them are in the uh, Midwest. Minnesota has 78 with about uh, 5,600 units, and Iowa has uh, uh, 17 with about 577 units. Uh, all of the development today is also continuing basically in the Midwest. Minnesota, Iowa, Missouri, and Kansas. 24 cooperatives uh, we consider prospective cooperatives. Uh, eight of those are under construction right now and will be open in the next uh, 12 to uh, 15 months. Question is, why are they all in the Midwest? Uh, and, and we have basically concluded over these years uh, that they're there because that's where the developers are who build these, and, and we'll talk a bit about that. That's where the lawyers are who do the legal work on these uh, projects. That's where the architects are who have designed and, uh, and done the uh, uh, architectural work on most of these office, <coughs> offices. And of that 104 cooperatives, uh, all but about uh, uh, 25 have a HUD-insured master mortgage to finance the projects. And what we have found over the years is that the Minneapolis HUD office has been the most instrumental in supporting these projects and approving the insurance 
uh, for these mortgages. Des Moines was also very supportive, and now uh, Kansas City is part of that as, uh, as well. But those are where the HUD offices have been. We were denied applications in the uh, Denver office here about six, seven years ago. We were denied applications in the Chicago office about five, six years ago. These two offices have been the most supportive of these uh, projects. They come in all different sizes and shapes. The smallest cooperative, we have two of them in Iowa that are 10 units. The largest is, is uh, 7,500 York at 318. This is Beckettwood, one of the uh, original uh, cooperatives as well, about 211 units uh, in Minneapolis. This is a real life cooperative in Bloomington, a little different design and style. <coughs> real life in Mankato, a smaller and outstate Minnesota. A homestead cooperative about 30 miles north of St. Paul. It's a 26 unit uh, cooperative. The back side of that cooperative is their own private lake. Uh, so this one has some uh, scenic amenities as well. Uh, this is a village cooperative in Fergus Falls, a village cooperative in, uh, in uh, Wausau, uh, Cardinal Point in Maplewood, Bullerbrook Cooperative in Mankato. Now, interiors uh, vary somewhat, but there's a lot of similarities. They all have a main entry lobby uh, where people can gather and, uh, and enter the building. Uh, there's a, a manager's office, usually right off the lobby. In this case, it's right in there. Uh, mailboxes are all central and generally down in that lobby area. All of the cooperative buildings have a community room that's used by the members for social activities, uh, uh, morning coffee, uh, you can see here a bingo, uh, card games, uh, whatever it might be. <clears throat> uh, this is an example of another uh, community room in another cooperative, a little different design, a little different layout. Uh, all of them today basically have fireplaces and large uh, big screen TVs in these uh, uh, rooms. They also have a community kitchen within the uh, cooperative, and that, this one is out. Whoops, this one is out of uh, Willowbrook. Uh, the uh, stove, refrigerator, and under this island is a, a dishwasher. Uh, and, and this one is a, a pantry for all the dishes and the serviceware for the cooperative. Uh, consistently and constantly used. Many of them today also have what they call a club room uh, for games or other activities. A pool table. Uh, uh, bar facilities, uh, craft room, uh, whatever it might be. The units are all full-sized units, and I'll give you an idea of what they look like with some sample floor plans here in a few minutes. Uh, but this is a full-size living room, uh, full-size dining room, full-size bedroom, second bedroom in, uh, in that unit, uh, full-size bathroom, uh, 15, 20 years ago when I got started in working with senior housing cooperatives, uh, a lot of the cooperatives had one bedroom units at about 700, 750 square feet, uh, maybe some two bedroom units up to uh, around 1,200, 1,300 square feet. Uh, today, the buildings that are being built, uh, very few of them have one bedrooms at all. There's no one bedrooms. Uh, us baby boomers want more space. <laughs> So the units have gotten larger. Uh, most the smallest units in some of the buildings we're working with today are around 1,100 square feet. Uh, largest units are up to two bedroom den or three bedroom at 15 to 1,600 square feet. They've gotten significantly larger. Two bedroom, uh, two bath have a walk-in shower in uh, one bath and a, a tub uh, in the other. Uh, full kitchens, uh, full appliances. Uh, this reflects one of the changes. I don't know if you can notice, but dishwashers are now built up off the floor so that we don't have to bend over and put our dishes in and out. One big, that's another big change that came about with the, uh, with the buildings. Uh, Full-sized uh, ranges, refrigerators uh, as, uh, as part of that as well. Uh, all of them have exercise rooms. Uh, some of them with donated equipment, some of them with new equipment, depending on the uh, building. Probably one of the number one attractions in Minnesota, and you'll see this a little later on, but uh, the, the benefit of living in a senior housing cooperative is underground heated parking. <laughs> that is one of the things most members like. Uh -huh. And it's generally diagonal parking one way through the garage, so it's easy to uh, get in and out, and it's generally angled parking, so it's easy to get in and out. They also have a wash space for those who like to uh, wash their own vehicles. Uh, in the basement, uh, they can do that. There's a woodworking shop that's uh, available to uh, both male and female members of the cooperative, and in at least a couple cooperatives, 
There's more female members that use the wood shop than there are male. They all also have guest rooms. Uh, guest rooms are uh, rented on a first come, first served basis. Uh, Cooperatives normally charge uh, anywhere from $39 to $59 a night for anybody to use it. And it's basically to provide additional room for uh, family members who might be visiting at holidays or for parents who want their kids to come but don't want them to live with them, so they put them in the guest room. <laughs> Cost is basically to cover the uh, cleaning. Uh, every building has at least one. Many buildings today have two or three uh, guest rooms. This is another shot of what a uh, guest room looks like. They generally have little refrigerators in them as well for uh, uh, keeping food or, uh, or baby bottles or whatever it might be. All of them outside also have gardens. Uh, as most seniors have left single family homes where they're able to have gardens, whether flower or vegetable gardens, uh, almost all of these projects uh, also have a site somewhere outside on the property for uh, members to uh, uh, grow and to do their own gardening. What? Oh, I hate that. <laughs> I apologize. I thought I'd gotten rid of that. <clears throat> Why is it cooperatives uh, are as popular as they are? And, and what we really have here are the five key points that a guy by the name of Luke Moberg identified back in 1978 with 7,500 York. Luke worked for Ebenezer Services. Ebenezer is a long-term a care facility or a care manager uh, in the Twin Cities, part of the Fairview Health Organization. And Luke observed this population in Edina and Richfield that was aging, basically a blue collar workforce, uh, aging but basically in good health, but getting tired of taking care of uh, mowing their lawns, shoveling the snow, raking the leaves, changing the storm windows, and looking for another alternative, but the only alternatives available were assisted living or long-term care. And he bounced these ideas around for a while, and finally somebody said, you're talking about a cooperative. Why don't you build a cooperative? And that's what happened. That, that's what, uh, how 7500 7, York uh, was created. And the points he was looking for was a situation where members would remain in control at a time of life when most of the other alternatives required sacrificing that control. They lost the ability to make their own decisions. A, a, a facility where they could preserve their equity and not have a spend down of assets. Uh, preserve the benefits of home ownership. Membership share in a cooperative, you're entitled to use your pro rata share of the interest payment and real estate taxes as a deduction on your personal income tax. Uh, the money, they would save money by more efficient use of resources and no profit to an outside owner. The co-op is owned by the members, so they're not paying for services that they don't need, such as food services or whatever it might be. <clears throat> and the other part of it is they do not pay for services that they don't want or they don't need, uh, such as assisted living. Now this last point is one that we've added after observing the senior housing cooperatives uh, for almost uh, 37 years. And some information I'll show you in a little bit. Uh, well, actually, I don't have it in here. Uh, on, uh, on seniors is that seniors, we believe, live longer, healthier lives in senior housing cooperatives. And it's because of the, we think, it's because of the participative nature of the organization, uh, the friendships, the governance, the social interaction, that's all part of it. Uh, the foundation has done two surveys of individual members. Our first one was in 2010. We had about 1,300 surveys returned. We just finished our 2015 survey and we had about 1,200 surveys returned. And, and one, of the, uh, one of the questions we asked is the age of the members living in the cooperative. I think we had 32 cooperatives respond, and out of those 32, there were three members living in senior housing cooperatives that were over 100 years old. Uh, all living independently, with no care or whatever, living independently in the organization. And part of what we're doing with these surveys is collecting data to, uh, to uh, build a case that these are healthier organizations and that seniors do live longer uh, in a senior housing cooperative. At about the same time, uh, um, Gerald Glazer, who was a gerontologist for Ebenezer, testified before the President's Commission on Housing. And his comment was that from a gerontological point of view, the essential benefit of the cooperative is that it provides an economic structure and a social framework that fosters self-reliance, self-control and determination, 
interdependence and cooperation among the resident members, even among those with severe chronic conditions. As gerontologists, we know that these factors contribute directly to continued independent living, successful aging, and the enhancement of longer life. Now that was about five years after 7500 York has opened, and now we have an additional 100 uh, some cooperatives that we're building or can support these same comments on living a healthier, longer life. Rick Fenske was with a uh, market research firm, Maxfield Research in Minneapolis, and he made the observation that it's important to understand that the cooperative concept appeals to older adults, especially couples, who would not normally consider senior housing and who typically would remain in their single family homes. And one of the questions we asked in our survey is what influenced you to move into your cooperative? And we had about 50 responses that said, my spouse. And it was about half and half. About half of the male respondents said it was their, their female spouse. About half of the females said it was their male spouse who convinced them to move in. There's community benefits to senior housing cooperatives, particularly in the smaller rural areas where you're able to re, re, uh, the, uh, keep the seniors and the community's economic, social, and intergenerational foundations. You keep their financial resources and contributions in that community. The resale of their homes creates a ripple effect and frees up affordable housing alternatives for younger families. Cooperatives pay full real estate taxes, and they create some employment opportunities. Now, not a lot, because most cooperatives employ two people, an office manager and a maintenance person. And depending on the size of the uh, cooperative, they may or may not be full-time individuals. Um, but on the other hand, they contract for a lot of services. Lawn mowing, snow removal, almost all of them have plumbers under some sort of a contract, electricians under a contract, uh, HVAC, window cleaning, uh, 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 deck cleaning, uh, furnace cleaning, etc. all is, uh, as part of that. This is, uh, I, was, I was mentioning the uh, surveys we just completed. This is the results of our 2010 and uh, 2015 survey. One of the questions we asked was, do you like living in your cooperative better than or the same as your previous home? And have you recommended cooperatives to others? Would you move to the cooperative again? And do communities need cooperative living options? You can see in 2010, we were, you can see in 2010, we're running right around 90, 92% for these first three questions. The last one was uh, pretty high. I have two numbers on this first question in 2015. And we think we had a survey problem in the uh, question because 88% said that they liked living in their cooperative better than or the same as their previous home. But when you went through the rest of the survey, they had nothing critical or negative about living in the cooperative. And we think the way we had it marked, they were checking no when they meant to check yes. And so we went through the individual surveys and came back. It suggests that there's about a 94% positive rating for senior housing cooperatives, 94% uh, uh, on the recommendation of others. Would you do it again? A uh, very high satisfaction rate. What, the other thing about senior housing cooperatives back in the community benefits is that the vast majority of members moving into a senior housing cooperative come within a three mile radius of the cooperative. Now, in the last five years, we've seen that expand out a little bit to about five miles. Uh, but again, it's back to the fact that they, they can move into the cooperative. They can stay with the same church, the same banks, the same doctors, the same pharmacies, some of their same friends. So it's all right in the same neighborhood that they're used to. What is it you like most about your cooperative? We asked the question is, what influenced you to move into your cooperative? The number two reason, or the two top reasons Number one was location. Number two was no maintenance. After they're in there, when we ask them about what they like, number one, com number one comes up the people. We like the people. Uh, maintenance comes in at number two, and we and our mar the marketing people we showed this to found this very interesting. Uh, location comes in way down here at uh, at number five. Uh, the other thing we had this time around was that. They like everything in the cooperative. A very high number like everything. But the point is, is that there's a lot of satisfaction living there. And security is one. The social involvement. And here's the underground heated parking. Uh, 
uh, comes in as a very high percentage by men, uh, by seniors. <clears throat> what did you dislike? Uh, this was the first time we had 350 responses that said nothing. There's nothing we dislike about our cooperative. And I think that's pretty remarkable uh, uh, for some of these uh, buildings. Issues with the building was number two. Uh, we had two cooperatives that participated in the survey that had brand new buildings that were less than a year old. And under any construction project, you're going to have problems with the developer and the contractor. Uh, so that showed up in here. Uh, the, other, the other things that showed up in here is uh, the unit sizes, as I mentioned. Uh, you know, 20, 30 years ago, the units were 750, 800 square feet. Now they're 1,100. We had a lot of comments that I wish my one-bedroom unit was larger than it is. Uh, so that's some issues with the uh, building. Most of the original buildings also had central laundries. All the new buildings have laundries within the unit. And that was a complaint. I wish I had a laundry in my unit. I don't like the central laundry. I don't like the fact that I can't do rugs in that laundry. Uh, some of them don't have balconies. If you recall that picture of York, they had no balconies. Uh, all of them today have balconies, and actually many of them have screened in porches. The other comment was I have no place to shake my rugs, no place to go outside and shake my rugs. Those were the kind of building issues. Uh, rules are uh, pretty consistent, and whenever you go from a single family living situation to a multifamily, you have to have rules, you have to have policies. Those are difficult for people to adjust to. Uh, complainers, too many complainers in the building. Uh, too many cases where we don't have enough input in the decisions. Uh, the noise issue uh, was higher in 2015 than 2010, but interestingly enough, the increase in the noise complaint was from outside noise, not in the building, outside noise, particularly from people living uh, along the uh, street side of the buildings where there was a lot more street noise now. Uh, gossip, bitty <coughs> gossip or bitty busybodies, uh, yard access costs. Um, the Second to the bottom one here says, aging need younger members. One of the concerns of some of these seniors is that the building is aging, and which, is the, which they're designed to do, uh, to age in place in the building, but they're getting concerned that too many of their fellow member owners are getting too old, and we'd like some younger members in there. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm assuming between 2010 and 2015, the actual number of people surveyed increased. So. You're, you're looking at raw numbers, not percentages or, or ratios of people. The, these are raw numbers. We had 1,300 surveys in 2010 okay. and 1,200 surveys in 2015. Oh, so about the same. Yeah, pretty much the same. Okay. Uh, we also had five cooperatives. We, we presented all this data last week at our annual conference, and we had some cooperatives who said we didn't participate. We have five cooperatives that are now going back and doing the survey. So we're going to have some new numbers, which we'll publish later in the year. But I'm guessing they're not going to change a lot. One of the things about senior housing cooperatives that seniors like, and this is a survey that was done by uh, ARP a few years ago, in terms of as you age, what is it you're going to need help with? The uh, number one response was outdoor maintenance, yard work, uh, leaves, snow. Uh, heavy housework was number two. Light maintenance was number three. Uh, trips to the store was number four, and then light housework, cooking meals, and personal grooming. Living in a senior housing cooperative addresses these first four issues uh, in total, because you have no maintenance, you have no outside work to deal with, you have no heavy housework, it's just within the unit that you have to be concerned about. Trips to the store, all cooperatives either have a van on site that's used to take members to the doctor or the pharmacy or whatever, or there's a local community transportation system that does that. So there's transportation available uh, to all members. Uh, these are independent living facilities, so they don't provide any meals or any services uh, to the members. But many of the cooperatives have meals on wheels or some sort of food service delivered to the members uh, on a daily or weekly basis. And personal grooming, there are some members who have, uh, who have uh, uh, personal groomers come in to help them with uh, with bathing or home care or health care uh, or uh, light housework. They bring in people to help with light housework. So the bottom three are the ones they have to deal with. The top four are taken care of by living in a senior housing cooperative. In terms of market, there is a, a tremendous market. I mentioned earlier how many we have living today in senior housing cooperatives. Uh, this chart 
shows the uh, by age groups. Uh, this top one being us baby boomers, 65 to 74, 75 to 84, and then 85. And we're right here in 2015. And you can see the millions of seniors we're looking at in the United States that would be eligible for these services or eligible to live in a cooperative. We have a very small proportion that's doing it. Now, this is important for two reasons. Number one, it says there's a tremendous market opportunity for new co-op development. But probably, or maybe more important, is the fact that there is a tremendous market for the resale of your membership share when and if you have to sell it. And that's what we're finding, is that uh, there's a, a tremendous uh, market for share resales uh, today. A share comes up for sale, and I had a, had a um, uh, co-op member yesterday tell me that the share sold within four hours. All of the cooperatives have waiting lists. Most of the cooperatives have waiting lists of at least one on the wait list per unit in the building. And this cooperative has 94 units, they have 95 on the waiting list, uh, and they ended up to person number 39 who ended up buying the unit, but it took four hours to go through that list to get to that person, uh, and they sold. Uh, this cooperative also, as of December 31, had 12 units for sale, and now have 10. Excuse me, they have two. They sold 10 uh, in that period of time. I mentioned they are insured with a HUD, in, or financed with a HUD insured master mortgage. A uh, HUD is the only game in town for long-term fixed interest rates. Uh, all of these projects are structured under Section 213 of the National Housing Act, uh, which is a section strictly for housing cooperatives. It's a fixed interest rate for uh, 40 years. Uh, today, that interest rate is about three and three quarters to four percent on a, a new building. <clears throat> so it's a long-term rate. What it does is it assures that the low interest rates that you have for today are available for all buyers uh, into the future. Uh, and the other advantage of using HUD is the third-party oversight. Uh, HUD must approve all budgets. So they review any potential increases in monthly charges to make sure they're warranted. They review and approve all changes in corporate documents, uh, again, to make sure that they're, they're protected uh, that the owners are being protected by whatever the uh, changes are. And part of the monthly charges required by HUD are uh, monthly deposits into replacement reserves and operating reserves. So that there's funding available if and when the uh, cooperative needs to replace flooring or uh, appliances, whatever. Yes? Two questions. Um, obviously, these are great advantages. Um, but it seems to me you could also have an excellent business plan that didn't include a HUD loan. Uh, are people doing this because of their, their requirements for low-income housing, or if HUD isn't going to approve them, we can go to whatever credit union we're in right now, I would think. Uh, these are not subsidized or low-income buildings. They're generally middle-income individuals, so they don't involve any, uh, any subsidized uh, rents or anything like that. Uh, there, there are several advantages to using a HUD-insured master mortgage. Uh, first of all, as I said, they're the only ones that will do a 40-year fixed rate. And so a part of the monthly charge, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but a part of the monthly charge is the unit's pro rata share of that mortgage principal and interest. And the monthly charge can be about two-thirds, or the uh, uh, principal and interest can be about two-thirds of that monthly charge. So if you've got that fixed for 40 years. No, I understand all that, but it, it seems like you could also have a, a, a similar use you, a land trust model or a, you know, some other. Uh, well, there's nobody else that will do 40-year financing that we found. If you know of somebody, no, let us know. That's true. I'm not arguing that. I'm just saying it looks like we could do this with a different business model. You can do it with a bit different business model, but there's several disadvantages that we have found. Okay. Number one is that these uh, uh, units, the membership shares, sell easier with a HUD insured master mortgage or a master mortgage of some sort. Mm -hmm. There are four cooperatives in Minnesota that are now between eight and ten years old. Uh, one of them I was just at yesterday, they're eight years old, 78 units, they still have ten units they've never sold. Mm -hmm. the, there's another one that's about nine, eight years old, they sold their last unit in the spring. There's two more that still have units that they have not sold. That's one disadvantage. 
The second disadvantage is on the share resale side. Uh, if there's not a master mortgage associated with that share resale, we've also found that they are very difficult to sell. Okay. The third disadvantage is the reserves. We found that some of these cooperatives that do not have the HUD oversight, all of the homesteads we did that were not done with master mortgage. They're all 100% equity. We thought that was a great way to go back in the uh, 90s. What we found today is that most of them have stopped or have stopped years ago making deposits into their replacement reserves. Yep. Yep. And so now they're facing appliance replacements, flooring replacements, and looking at having to assess members for that cost. So those are the three big advantages in our view of having a HUD mortgage or, or not going without one, I should say. The initial sale, the resale, and the oversight on the reserves. And as I said, there's about 25 of the 104 that do not have a master mortgage. They are totally 100% equity financed. And that's what we're observing in those organizations. The big one is the lack of reserves. I was just curious if uh, HUD Denver gave you reasons as to why those applications weren't funded mm -hmm. over the morning. They didn't like the concept. Is that basic? Well, well, yeah. It, you know, I mean, part of what you're dealing with with this is, is you're talking about a developer going into a community and convincing 75, 80 year old people to move out of their house they've lived in for 60, 60, 50 to 60 years, downsize, move into a co-op, take on a monthly payment, and oh, by the way, you can probably move in here in about two or three years when we get the pre-sales and get it sold. They, and every market study we submit to HUD, even through Minneapolis, the market analysis say, why would somebody want to pay that much to buy into a unit rather than rent? The monthly charges in almost all of these projects are about or a little less than rental. And so you're making the payment in to own your share, but your monthly costs are about the same as the, uh, as the rental. But it's, it's the concept of 75, 80 year olds wanting to, uh, to move in. I told Bill at lunch today, my favorite example of this uh, was about five years ago in Northfield, Minnesota. Uh, we had this lady who moved from the nursing home to the assisted living facility to the independent rental, all part of the retirement community. They built the cooperative right next door. She liked the idea. She worked with the developer and the uh, marketer and convinced them that she was going to buy, but she wanted to do the purchase and the move all in this one week in March when both of her daughters were going to be on a Caribbean cruise <laughs> because she knew full well they wouldn't agree with it. And that's what happened. Now, what's remarkable, remarkable about that is that Marguerite was 95 years old. And the next year at 96, she got her driver's license. So does that answer your question on why, uh, on why HUD, ma'am? No, but that's OK. <laughs> no, I mean, I understand why HUD. I just think there, there are other ways it could be done that would merit looking at if Denver HUD is not going to approve it. And I imagine we're in the Denver area. Yeah. yeah but, and, HUD has changed dramatically, so that may change now. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't want you to believe that we couldn't do a HUD-insured master mortgage in this area anymore. HUD has gone through a major transformation. Yes? A related question then on, the, on the little threefold here, or doublefold. Uh, it says brief history. Uh, 90 cooperatives in eight states. Can you run down the states that we know that we've got many, uh, Minnesota and uh, Iowa? Which are the others? Minnesota, Iowa, Wisconsin, Michigan. Nebraska, Missouri, Arkansas, and uh, Washington. Washington. Washington State. Okay. Washington State. And then since Silver Glen in Bellevue, Washington. And since you're speaking to people in Montana, what, what's the, what are the prospects for Montana to get on board? I think the demand and the market is here for this kind of a concept. The challenge we've had, and we, and we worked out here about five, six years ago on a potential project in Hamilton, and we did some community meetings here in Missoula. The challenge we have is finding a developer willing to take on this kind of a process. Because you're talking about somebody who understands this concept, what it's all about. Somebody who's willing to make the investment to take the time that this is a two to three year project, you know, until you get somebody to move in. It's not a lot of front end investment, it's the time to make this work. And secondly, once the project is developed, you turn it over to the members and it's theirs. 
So there's no other, other there's no other tie to the developer. I mean, they don't get any payments after that. So to the developer, it's sort of a risk uh, risk benefit kind of. Correct. Balance? Yep. And actually, the way these cooperatives have developed is that the first thing that's done is the cooperative is created. The number one thing is to file papers with the Secretary of State to create the cooperative. Huh. And everything is done in the name of the cooperative. So what kind of developers do this? We have uh, five active developers in the Midwest right now. Uh, they are all uh, uh, for-profit developers. Um, they are all, well not all, um, one of the developers has been very involved in senior services during his entire career, mm -hmm. assisted living, memory care, uh, and has gotten into the uh, co-op business. He's done, I think, three cooperatives as one under construction is looking at number five. Uh, one of the developers uh, uh, simply liked the idea of senior housing cooperatives and they focus on seniors uh, completely. I think they've got like 25 they've done now. Uh, United Properties, that may or may not be a name familiar to you, but United Properties is owned by the Polads, the owners of the Minnesota Twins. Uh, they've been in the business for about uh, 12 years, developing co uh, cooperatives, basically in Minnesota. I mean in the Twin Cities, uh, strictly in there. And we have a new developer that we've been working with for the last uh, 12 months who was doing assisted living facilities in the Twin Cities, but sees that that market's maybe potentially getting overbuilt and wanted something else and uh, started looking at, uh, at cooperatives. So they're for-profit developers. The original ones were started by non-profit oh, developers, okay. Ebenezer yeah. Episcopal Church Homes, yeah. but for the last uh, 20 years it's been for-profit developers. Yes? Just curious if uh, one, sounds like it would be a good, interesting conversation with Denver, but as you go through the HUD mortgage processing, uh, we, we deal with HUD all the time. It's um, deed restricted rental housing and some home ownership. Is there any benefit in this particular master mortgage program to have a CHOTO, a community housing development organization, or somebody apply that has had experience, or is it totally separate? Uh, I'm sorry, what was your last point? Is it, is it advantageous to have somebody who has experience with HUD, their systems and processes in the application involved versus somebody you know, straight out of like a community housing development organization in which we are? I didn't, I didn't know if that helped. The, uh, the only requirement that we have seen HUD place on, uh, on these projects is that the contracts have HUD experience because of the Davis-Bacon rules on, sure. on labor and wages. Mm -hmm. uh, but no, I, okay. I, the, new, the uh, heart development we're working with, they don't have experience at all. Mm -hmm. And we're in the process of uh, working on a project with them. But it might be advantageous to have somebody who administers Davis-Bacon as a developer in their projects. Well, at least as a contractor, not the developer contractors and, and, and I mean the difference is is that the developers aren't necessarily the same folks doing the construction right, right. and so what, what HUD is looking for is the general contractor that's doing the actual construction that yeah, they, they have to do their data reporting so yep. we have to ensure our contractors do that too. Yep. So yep. Yes, yes ma'am. What is the typical range of buy-in for the shares? We're going to get to that in a minute. Okay. If I have it right, you can't just buy it and pay for it and pay monthly? Correct. We'll get to that in a minute. Okay, yep. right. well, one of the other characteristics of most of these cooperatives, of about 80 uh, of these, well, no, about 100 of these cooperatives, is that they have what's called limited equity growth. The value of the membership share appreciates at a fixed amount each year. And that's generally set at 1% plus your share of the mortgage amortization and any upgrades you may have put into the unit. Now the, the reason this, and this was set into uh, York by uh, Luke Mulberg, uh, the reason for this again is that it helps ensure that there's an affordable predicting, predictable pricing for future buyers. So the day you buy your share, you can figure out exactly what that share will sell for 15 years down the road because it's all calculated out on a formula basis. And it helps keep the costs of buy-in at an affordable level. Affordable level. Uh, it, it makes sure that there's buyers for the shares. And it also keeps the focus on the priorities of the community, stability, and security. 7,500 York, first cooperative. Today, it's a $5,000 uh, deposit to get on their waiting list. <laughs> it's fully refundable, but depending on the unit, your wait time can be anywhere from 5 to 12 years. <laughs> And a big part of it is this factor right here in terms of the affordability of buying that membership share 
huh. and the monthly charges. And that's one of the advantages of this whole structure is this waiting list that it creates for people wanting to buy in. And I mentioned these sales. I mean, most cooperatives today, if they have a membership share that comes up for sale, it's sold within seven to 10 days in most cases. Yes, sir. So with the, um, what are you looking for? Uh, cooperatives having the first option to purchase, uh, they go by purchasing at this one year, 1% per year rate of so the set purchase amount that the cooperative establishes? That provision is into the bylaws of the cooperative for them to help protect that wait list, mm. is what that is. Mm. So if a membership share comes up for sale, if I lived in a cooperative and put my share up for sale today, notify the co-op that I'm gonna sell my share, they have 60 days before they take their option of purchase. What they do is that all cooperatives have two waiting lists, an internal list and an external list. An internal for people that have moved in but want a different unit in the building different size, different side of the building, whatever. And in fact, for a while, there were a number of, of members moving into a cooperative into a one bedroom unit just so they got in there on that waiting list. Oh, yeah, right. So they could get to the next one. So the internal waiting list is first. Nobody in the internal list wants it. Then the external wait list is contact. And once you're on that external list, you stay on the list. If you're number one, you can stay on number one and you can just tell the co-op, well, I don't want to move for five years, so don't call me until the five years are up. Huh. But you stay in order on that wait list. Once somebody in the wait list decides to buy, at the closing is when the cooperative then exercises its right to purchase. And it's not as if it purchases it today and then sells it okay. two months from now. It's all a simultaneous uh -huh. transaction. Co-op pays no money. It's all done as part of that. So you don't have an option to sell it to, let's say, a relative or, no. a, rel or a relative to someone? No. Okay. Now, if they're on the waiting list, I mean, you know, it could happen if they're on, they happen to be on the waiting list uh, to do that. And you can get on the waiting list at any point. I mean, some co-ops have 35-year-olds on their waiting list today uh, just so they're on the wait list when they can get in there. But if they're next in line on the wait list, that would be the only way you could do it. You don't have your choice to do it. Now, the question was asked on what you pay. One is the share payment, uh, which is repaid with appreciation, as we just talked about. The other is the monthly payment, which includes your pro rata share of the expenses, the reserves, the utilities, taxes, and mortgage payment. Uh, today, the monthly, the monthly payment to most members on new cooperatives includes uh, all utilities except, ga uh, except uh, electric. Electric would be uh, billed uh, separately, but it includes gas, water, sewer, track, obviously. It also includes all TV, telephone, and internet. Uh, they've all, or not all, most of them have gone to a central installation of, uh, of direct TV, uh, 40 to 60 meg, uh, internet, and uh, 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 telephone systems within the uh, building as well. That's all included in the monthly charge. The only bill you have to pay is your electric bill. Hmm. So what's the average? We'll get to that in a minute. <laughs> I, I, I thought I was going to be there sooner, but my slides are different than I thought. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this one, uh, but this is the uh, the uh, hand. Up. This is the hand up you have as part of your packet, and it identifies the uh, differences between uh, the various uh, forms of uh, of senior living ownership, single family uh, rental, and uh, condominium. Uh, the, the two biggest differences, I would say, in this whole thing are the financing, and that there's a master mortgage, so you don't have to worry about financing. Uh, two is that you're an owner in the uh, cooperative, uh, and there's rules and regulations you have to abide by. But one of, the, one of the requirements in these is that the board of directors must approve or reject all memberships. So everybody coming into the cooperative must uh, uh, complete a membership application. And that includes financial information, number one, uh, to make sure that there's sufficient resources for you to cover your share of the, uh, of the cost and that you don't put the rest of the members uh, uh, at risk. But even if you don't, the cooperative has a first uh, lien on your membership share. So if you don't pay your monthly charges when that share sells, the cooperative gets to take the proceeds that's owed to them and you get the rest of it. The other is what's generally called security. And it's not just building security, but they all have a that. I uh, have that. But one of the one of the characteristics of this membership approval is that obviously the board cannot discriminate against protected classes. 
These are age-restricted buildings, 62 and older today, so there's no age restriction in the, you know, the uh, sex, religion, disability, etc. But beyond that, a board can decide whether or not the membership is appropriate for the building. And, uh, and I use the example that if I applied and they don't like the glasses I wear, they could reject my application. Now, the, the two best examples we have of that are the Nixons and the Clintons. And in both cases, when they left the White House, each of those couples wanted to move into a cooperative on Park Avenue. And in both cases, the board rejected their applications. <laughs> said they wouldn't fit, and just as importantly, the Secret Service, the paparazzi, everything else, would be a total disruption to the community. So you have, a, the, the co-op has the ability to, uh, to uh, uh, bring in like members, if you will. The other part of many applications today is a criminal background check. Uh, that's become fairly common. Yes, sir? You have to, like they do in, in co-ops, like we were used to live in New York City, that you like state your case to the board personally, or doesn't that come into effect? No, okay. generally not. Uh, generally what happens is the cooperatives have a marketing committee. And so the marketing committee would have met with you uh, you would, would have been invited to uh, probably several open houses, so the board would have had a chance to meet you. The other members would have had a chance to meet you. Uh, and that's all part of the interview process, if you will. Would that happen before you go on the list? Uh, yes, it could. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think that would make more sense. Why yeah. be on the list if yeah. no, no. Well, and, and there's, there's one director I was talking to yesterday. They just had an open house, I think, a couple of weeks ago. They had 58 couples that came through on their open house, and 15 of them signed up on the waiting list. And most of them had been to an open house already, so this wasn't their first one. But yeah, that would happen ahead of them. But that's useful information in trying to compare the alternatives uh, that exist. Here's some floor plans uh, of, uh, of different uh, facilities, or different uh, uh, units within a building. Uh, this is uh, one of the uh, projects that's still on the small side compared to some of them we have today. Uh, all of the units have their own heating and cooling system called the Magic Pack. That's just a little closet on the deck. Uh, this is a one-bedroom den. Uh, you'll notice there's a huge walk-in closet, uh, the bathroom, uh, individual uh, washer, dryer, uh, and storage. Some of the units have more storage than that. Uh, this, whoops, this one has a, a large storage within the uh, laundry unit and a full separate storage unit right here off the uh, kitchen in addition to the walk-in closet. This one's a little larger, and again, uh, some of the same characteristics. None of the buildings are laid out as, as long buildings. They're all W's or X's or whatever, so they're short hallways. And so you end up with these units that are, uh, well, you can see the floor, the floor plan of this building is kind of a, a split open U. Mm -hmm. But it's designed so that they're not all long hallways into the building. This is one of the uh, larger units at 1,400 square feet. The uh, two bedroom, again, the uh, big walk-in closet. The, uh, this is the bath, two baths right here. Laundry with storage in it, separate storage facility, or separate storage, separate storage unit over here. And this is the uh, largest uh, unit uh, in this particular building. Again, the uh, separate large storage unit. Laundry is up over in this area. The uh, two baths in the unit, walk-in closet, break room and kitchen. Here's the question you've been looking for. Here's the share price and monthly charge uh, ranges on this particular building. Uh, the share prices are about 45% of total unit uh, uh, charges. So in the one bedroom, one den, roughly about uh, 60 to $68,000, uh, all the way down to the large two bedroom, two bath at. Uh, 88.6 to 101. Uh, oftentimes, in almost all cases, the monthly charges are at around anywhere from a buck 10 to a buck 20 a square foot. Now these are at about a buck. Uh, those prices have gone up a little bit today. When we do the uh, the uh, pricing on them, the square the uh, uh, monthly charges are around a buck 10 to a buck 20 a square foot. Can you repeat that percentage of share price? This is uh, I think this one is 45 percent of total unit value. The rest of it is financed under the master mortgage. And these vary depending on the building. 
Uh, actually, this developer now, it's not on this building, but on the uh, new buildings he's doing, uh, he's doing screened-in porches. So they're almost like three-season porches. So the cost has gone up somewhat because of that. Uh, unit sizes on this new building. Uh, the, the smallest one right now is 1,100 square feet. This one is up to uh, 1,600 square feet. Any questions or comments on that? So this is an average of, of, of all of basically most of these eight states. No, this would not be an average. This would be this would be more similar to current pricing on a project. In what state? Uh, this is the Midwest. This is, this is a, I think in Minnesota, Wisconsin project. Yeah. It, it depends on the construction cost. What we're finding today is that these prices in Iowa and Kansas are higher uh, because of the, uh, the uh, wage rates in those states. And I'm not sure about Montana, what the wage rates would be out here, but in those two states, uh, these prices have gone up because of the uh, wages. And in the Midwest, and I told Bill driving over here today, it's probably true here as well, there is just a boon in construction. Contractors are having a heck of a time keeping uh, 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 people on the job. Uh, the labor carpenters there this afternoon, they come back to, uh, tomorrow morning and they've all gone to somebody else because they offered them a buck an hour more or whatever. So uh, construction costs, both uh, labor and material, have increased uh, quite a bit in the last 12 months. Yes? And are most of these places uh, being fairly sensitive to Things like alternative energy and uh, recycling and all those things that we all care about out here? Uh, the, the only one that is, is not being done too much with yet is alternative energy. These are all done with traditional electric uh, gas uh, supply. Uh, right now we have three existing cooperatives looking at solar power and uh, looking at how they can tie into solar power as part of that. Uh, that has been looked at in a couple of new projects, but the cost has been considered uh, too prohibitive for marketing. I was thinking more things like hyper insulation and oh, yes. double plane windows. And yep. Yep. Uh, energy efficiency, that, and that's a HUD requirement, yeah, energy efficiency. All of these buildings, too, by the way, uh, they are built with the double wall construction so that the walls between the units are double walls and insulated for uh, uh, noise and, uh, and uh, uh, sound barriers. Uh, so yes, they are, they are very energy efficient. And all of the cooperatives are using some sort of recycling. Uh, actually, in Minnesota, that's mandatory. Everybody has to use it. Uh, are the uh, appliances uh, redone if they break down by the cooperative? And uh, whether they are or aren't, do the owners have the option to upgrade their appliances on their own? Under, under the uh, construction or new development, uh, the uh, developer will select standard models for uh, stoves, refrigerators, cabinets, cabinet fronts, countertops, uh, and will generally have one or two upgrade options for the members at their expense. That's an addition to the uh, monthly charge. Once the cooperative gets up and running, they set their own standards. Maybe the same, maybe a little different. But again, the cooperative owns the appliances, owns the flooring, maintains those units, uh, maintains the appliances if there's a uh, cleaning service or whatever. Uh, and if they need replacement, the members can do an upgrade if they want at the member's expense. And depending on the appliance upgrade will determine whether or not the cooperative continues to maintain. Mm -hmm. For example, if they have refrigerators with no ice makers, mm -hmm. you want a refrigerator, refrigerator with an ice maker, they're not going to maintain the ice maker. Takes that little place north of the deck. Yeah. Yeah. So That's the magic pack. That's the heating and cooling unit. Mm -hmm. That's the furnace air conditioning <laughs> for the unit. They're called magic packs. Or sky packs, although sky pack went out of business, they're magic mm -hmm. packs. They sit right outside the deck. They're quiet. They're not noisy or anything, but they sit right outside the deck in a uh, closed, uh, locked closet. Yes. Is there any storage area in the parking area? The uh, question is, is there storage area in the parking area? Uh, most of the buildings today have done a caged storage unit above the uh, front of the car mm -hmm. on the garage wall. 
uh, and it's caged because of fire considerations and fire marshals, etc. Most of the buildings also have other nooks and crannies somewhere in the building that have been uh, designated as storage areas that you can rent in addition to uh, what you have within your unit. So if you want to secure your bicycle, or skis, whatever, you could do it and not have to drag them up to your... Oh, absolutely. The garages, the garages all have room for bicycles. That's not a problem. They have separate, most of them have separate areas for bicycle. Uh, so they don't have to be taken up stairs. The original cooperatives, uh, you know, this one has this storage unit right here. The original cooperative designs did not have that. Those storage units were built somewhere else in the building. And you had to go to, the, to that storage unit to get whatever you wanted. But that's part of the demand and the change. Not only did you have to, not only do they now have laundry units in the building, in the units, the storage facilities are also coming into the units. And there's usually extra storage facilities somewhere in the building. All of them have, the basement parking is one car per unit. Mm -hmm. And there's additional parking outside for people that have more than, uh, than one bin. Well, yes. the uh, co-ops you have experience with, have any of them uh, defaulted or otherwise failed? There are none of the senior housing cooperatives that have defaulted, uh, which is one of the reasons uh, HUD is uh, support, at least Minneapolis HUD, uh, is supportive of these projects uh, because there's never been a default. And in most cases, the loan to collateral value ratio is 50 to 60 percent. So they're very secure. Uh, the units, even the new units under construction, once occupancy begins, the developer pays the monthly charges on all unsold units until they're sold. So the co-op is always 100 percent full. There are three co-ops in Minnesota that have converted from co-ops to condos. Uh, for whatever reason, they, they made the choice to convert from co-ops to condos. All three cases, none of them had HUD master mortgages. Uh, they were all uh, uh, full equity, but they chose to convert to condos. Uh, and in one case, it was a homestead. I think one of the reasons they did is they hadn't been collecting uh, reserve deposits, and they were getting up to having to uh, make replacements in the building, and they decided that rather than trying to assess everybody, they convert to a, to a uh, condo. And under Minnesota law, that has to be 100% member approval. Uh, we have a Minnesota Common Ownership Interest Act, so any of those kinds of changes must be approved by all members. Not a majority, but all members. Have you ever seen a condo go to a co-op? No. We have not seen any conversions the other way. Uh, and uh, uh, again, under the uh, Minnesota law, the condo would have, all of its owners would have to agree to that. Oh. And so they uh, probably wouldn't. Uh, um, uh, and we've not seen any conversions. You know, there's been some who have talked about converting apartment buildings to senior housing. The challenge is that most of those units are too small for uh, uh, senior housing co-ops. They're not big enough for what seniors are demanding today. The other comment on the HUD financing, the other reason for the HUD financing, is HUD requires owner occupancy, so you do not have investors owning and, uh, and leasing. Uh, HUD also requires no business in the units. So they're all residential uh, units within the building. You cannot conduct business out of the units, which is another advantage and consistency uh, to the uh, co-op. I can see that this foundation that you're working for is a wonderful asset to developing these things. I'm impressed. Are there co-ops that you <laughs> that aren't yours? Are there, I mean, uh, are, are there people doing it independently without the foundation advice or little different models? The, the role of the foundation is to promote the successful development and operation of senior housing cooperatives. We do not get involved in development at all. We have another company, Cooperative Housing Resources, that is a HUD-approved lender. And through that vehicle, we work with developers on financing, et cetera. But the foundation just promotes senior housing cooperatives. But I bet, you know, in Oregon or Connecticut or are there, are there co-ops that aren't lots? To our knowledge, there are not. Uh, now, there may be one or two that we've learned about um, uh, and we're still checking on. There are other cooperatives that call themselves senior housing cooperatives, and we've had conversations with several of those in the last year, particularly out of New England. But once we really start talking to them, what we find out is that about a third of the units are owned by the developer or the management company, and they're rented out. Uh, and the uh, developer or management company has somebody on the board. 
That's not true in any of these cooperatives. They're all independently owned and occupied. So that so that's a difference. Yes, sir. Is there such a thing as a as a model real estate cooperative law, and does Montana have anything that like that? There is not a model real estate cooperative law. Uh, the only state that I know has, that has a uh, cooperative housing statute is Iowa. Uh, even Minnesota doesn't have one. Uh, we've been looking at one, but uh, no, there isn't. And in fact, when we were looking at doing a uh, co-op in Hamilton here about five, six years ago, the recommendation was that it be created as a Minnesota cooperative doing business in Montana. And the uh, cooperatives in Wisconsin, Kansas and Missouri are all being created as Minnesota cooperatives doing business in those other states. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes? Um, do you know, are you going to no, talk about Missoula or Hamilton where this will be? I'm sorry? Your location, is it going to be in Missoula or Hamilton? We don't have a location. Oh. Uh, and this meeting is about the potential or possibility for one in Missoula. Are we going to talk about next steps? Yes, in a minute. <laughs> I also... Uh, in Utah, show you any interest? No, we've not heard anything from Utah. I said Bill asked that today if we're getting requests from other areas. And uh, uh, we're getting, uh, most of our requests are coming from Texas. <laughs> and there are individuals that own 40, 50, 60 acres of land and want to uh, put on uh, 80 to 90 single family homes with a horse arena in the middle. And I mean, they're probably very good, very viable projects, but that's not the business of the group we, uh, we work with. I have a video here that I'd like to show you. Was that there's a there's a facility in uh, in uh, Missoula where you uh, buy into the building, you live there, and when the share sells, it goes back to the the profit goes back to the developer. There are uh, a number of organizations like that in the in the Midwest as well. There's a term for them. I'm forgetting it right now. Uh, but there are some of those that have been created after cooperatives became so popular uh, as a way to uh, kind of copy uh, cooperatives, if you will. Uh, there's also some of those that have gone broke uh, that have created some real challenges for the uh, people living in the building because in some cases they're supposed to get some of that money back uh, and they never did. Um, so, I, I mean, it's another form of uh, business, but it's, uh, it's a different style. A couple years ago, the foundation pulled together a committee of about eight members of senior housing cooperatives to uh, take a look at uh, what it is or how can we promote this, uh, this concept uh, in a better way. Uh, out of that, we created Carefree Living in a Vibrant Community, which is a brochure, which you have, as well as a, a video. And I'd like to take a couple of minutes, well, that's a, actually about a 10-minute video, and uh, uh, introduce people that actually live in senior housing quarters. at uh, townhomes and then some friends suggested that we come here to an open house and uh, we both came thinking yes um, we'll go but we know this is not for us so we just sat at the open house and heard all of the discussions of what a co-op is and walked around and saw units and so on and um, went home and didn't see anything when we went home the next morning, we both admitted to each other, this sounds like it would be a good thing. 
we hit for a number of years, uh, spent the winters in Arizona, and that was kind of a fun community, and I saw that there was going to be some of that same lifestyle in the cooperative, and that was attractive to us. You get to a time in your life when you know you may want to do something else. I mean, taking care of the yard and shoveling the snow and all these things, and I think it actually happened to me one day after I finished mowing the yard, and I had this sense I didn't want to mow the yard anymore. And we didn't want to go into a condominium because we literally take all the assets or the money from the sale of our home and give it back to somebody else. And that's when we noticed in the paper in real life and put an ad in there saying they were in the process of building a building on this site. And they invited us down to one of the uh, real life properties in Bloomington, took us down there in the bus, gave us lunch, and let us walk through the building and talk to some of the residents. We were living ready to buy uh, when we got done. I mean, if we could have signed some papers on the bus coming back, we would have done it. Uh, and it was just absolutely everything we wanted. And it ends up obviously being more. We have many amenities in the building. Beautiful library, a big party room, lots of social activities. And again, no maintenance, no outside maintenance, just keeping up your own home. We have beautiful gardens. You just sign up for it and go to town. We have a workshop for men and women. It's not just for men. It does have all the power tools in it, but it's a great place to lay out a quilt pattern or because you've got the wide open space where you might not have that in your home, where you just have a kitchen counter or a table that you set up. I've personally worked with people where it's taken them maybe two or three years. They've gotten on the wait list. It's taken them a while. Finally, they made the decision, put the house on the market, moved in, and then they'll come and say, I don't know why I didn't do this 10 years ago. I don't have to worry about the upkeep on my home. I don't have to worry about cutting the grass. I don't have to worry about having the driveway plowed. I don't have to worry about a leaky faucet, a toilet that doesn't stop running. My worries are just over here. When I'm giving a tour, I try to tell the people about our lifestyle. What we offer here are catered dinners, and I tell them how wonderful the people are. And we have got a real nice group of people living at Applewood. And I just tell them you'd enjoy it. You'd love it here. I love to travel. And I've traveled a great deal. I don't have to give Applewood a thought. It's all taken care of for me. My mail can be brought in. They check my apartment to make sure that there's not a leaky faucet or water running. I'm just worried for you. It is a lifestyle, because we do, we go out together, we have dinners together out in restaurants, we have dinners here, and uh, we have a lot of bicycles downstairs, they bike ride together, they walk around, we have a pond right outside our door, and we walk around the pond every day. It's a lifestyle, <coughs> a healthy lifestyle. I can honestly say I feel like you know, I'm in my own home on a street in a town. I feel just as much privacy here as I did in our own home. And people are so respectful of that. We're all owners. Well, that gives such a different perspective. We're not looking and saying, oh, we're just lining their pockets by being conservative. Here, we're helping each other. And the whole building belongs to us. So if um, something arise someplace, it's in our, to our benefit to um, have that remedied or, or pitch in in whatever we, way we can. So we have, I have a board here, and they've been elected by the members who live here, and they live here, and that makes quite a difference. I took costs for maintenance and um, all of this and looked at that and uh, started just comparing that with what it was costing to live in our home. Then we began to see, so I compared those with living here, and it was really apples to apples. One of the things that seems to be 
a popular these days is trying to keep people in their own homes as long as possible. And oftentimes that can be isolating. Uh, people uh, just don't have neighbors who are there. Uh, they don't have family around. Uh, whereas if you're living together in a cooperative setting, you do have like family around. Generally, uh, what I've seen in, a, in the cooperative where we live is that people cooperate in terms of being able to serve the group in what in ways that are of interest to them and ways where they have expertise. And it just all seems to come together very nicely. One of the nice things is that, that there is a monthly fee and this monthly fee includes many things. It includes the mortgage, it includes the interest being paid on the mortgage for the building, it includes many of the services that you receive, it includes maintenance of the facility, it includes some kinds of administration. So your monthly fee includes all of those things. And so you end up not having to have a lot of bills at the end of the month. It's good to have a known kind of fee that, that you pay and, and uh, you don't have to worry about some huge increase. And you know, I mean, we make decisions about that. Uh, in the long run, uh, we're putting aside money for, for things that we may need need to replace as, as the building ages, that sort of thing. And, and so we're planning and anticipating all, all of those sorts of things, which I think is a, is a real advantage in cooperative living. Some of the best things I found out about living in a cooperative is the community spirit, the involvement of people, and the people here were very friendly, very welcoming, very wonderful. I'm a single lady, and I think the amenities here are just absolutely perfect for me. I feel very, very safe living here. Uh, it's affordable for a single person to live here, and it's, it's really a wonderful place to be. And it's really a wonderful, safe, warm feeling community and you do not feel alone there's always somebody there we miss the people back here i mean we got so involved in the building we i tell people we have more friends now than we ever had in our life i mean really good friends and so we were gone for maybe a couple of weeks and we looked at each other are you ready to go home yeah and you know we miss the people back here and people said oh did you miss your family i said well yeah but we miss the people back here in our building even more and i think maybe we went one more winter and we haven't gone away in the winter time since so and that's very common for a lot of people they, it's so easy to stay here because you've got everything you want here it's got to be a helpful thing you know it's, that's just one of the things that's that's much healthier to live here because of the companionship that you have What we really treasure the most is being in our own home, but having a big room that we could have guests in. It's just a pleasure to walk into such a beautiful place. But I think being able to be on the lake, have this um, patio out here to enjoy and welcome our guests to, it's just a pleasure to walk into such a beautiful place. In many cases, you read about where people, when they get retired, they wonder what they're going to do with the rest of their lives. And I think a number of people probably wait too long uh, to live in a senior cooperative and miss some of the real benefits of, of the social life. Had I known about this lifestyle, we might have done it six, eight, ten years sooner. It gives you a sense of community, a sense of ownership, a sense of opportunity and freedom to not be tied to the kinds of responsibilities you're tied to with private ownership of your own home. The sense of support in a setting where you can be who you are and you can cooperate, you can have friends, you can have coffee, you can do what you want. So plus, you know, the economic advantage to it of, of being in a cooperative. Well, I think the ideal candidate is anybody who wants to live a less cluttered lifestyle than they probably do in a house. And I think people who are interested in a form of living 
which is financially secure. Uh, they have an ownership in that in the in the uh, cooperative, which is extremely significant. Uh, but at the same time, they can live independently in that unit if they want to, or they can be as gregarious as they want to be with other people. And the opportunities for for working and, and just living with other people are multiple. I think probably every every cooperative has its own set of uh, things that it can do or that it offers people. But you don't have to be a part of anything if you don't want to be. You can be totally independent. You don't have to show up at the coffee hour. You don't have to show up at the potluck. You don't have to show up at this or that. Um, and still you can be a part of the group and, part, and enjoy the, the benefits of community that is a rather special community of people who are like, they're like-minded and they're of the similar age. I recommend the lifestyle. I really do. things they wish were different or whatever, need to attract younger people. If people buy into these, and as the, as the group gets older, um, is there, and I guess maybe this would be determined by the, the cooperative, the group, uh, of getting a, not assisted living per se, but like uh, on-site nurse, whatever, if people have difficulties with medications or remembering to take pills or something, or is that just something you need to ask your neighbors to help you out with? as you're getting older and maybe have other issues. When I first got involved with the senior housing cooperatives, one of the objectives we had was to locate them as far away from assisted living or nursing homes as possible. Because people moving in didn't want to even see those buildings. Uh, in the last five years, the last eight years, we've had two cooperatives that have been built right next to retirement care communities. Assisted living, independent living, and nursing homes. 7,500 York, uh, four years ago, or opened York Gardens on their property, which is a, I think it's a 36 unit assisted living memory care facility for members from York uh, to go into that facility. Uh, the, the other spouse, if necessary, can stay in the co -op. We have two other cooperatives right now. We have one other cooperative that had an, a, a, a greenhouse project built right next to it, which is the same thing, assisted living memory care. Uh, and we have three other cooperatives right now looking at doing the same thing, putting a facility for assisted living or memory care right next to them. That has become more popular. In lieu of that, there's a number of cooperatives where there's, I mean, there's home health care nurses that come into a lot of these buildings uh, for individuals. There's a couple that have contracted with home health care services and provide them an office in the building okay, for uh, part-time. that would be up to the membership? That's up to the co-op to make that decision, that's right. There's also one that did that, and the home health care service left because there wasn't enough business there to support it. Um, oh. well, what behind you, Yes? Well, are we going to find out anything about the possibilities? Because some of us actually don't need to be sold. But, you know, five years ago, I started looking at condominiums. Well, there haven't been any that are anywhere near Missoula. They're usually out of town where the land is cheap. Well, we're not really interested in moving out of town. I'm sorry, but I didn't choose to live up the river. Um, and I don't see much interest in developers building in town on anything like this. So I have two questions. What would make a developer do this rather than a condominium? Uh, right now, nobody's doing condominiums in town either. Would, how would we convince a developer, because I actually know a couple, to take a look at this? And what do we need to do? Well, first of all, from the developer's perspective, these are profitable uh, developments for them to do. So, I mean, it's not that they can't make any money on it. They can't. Uh, secondly, at 2 o'clock tomorrow, in here, we're holding a meeting for developers. So if you know developers who might be interested, encourage them to come, because we're, we are going to do some of the same on, the, on what this concept is all about, but also on what does it involve from a developer's perspective to see if we can't get some developers uh, interested in this concept. Okay. So 
So yes, we, the, the intent was, I mean, we've done this, we've worked with Bill for probably 10, 12 years on different things. I've been very interested in senior housing cooperatives. My partner worked with them before I even got involved in the business. Uh, and we did some of this work back here in, the, I think it was around 2008, 2009. Uh, nothing came of it. And uh, uh, Bill contacted me about a year ago and said, let's make another run. What do you think? I said, yeah. And, and we do this. We go around to communities in the Midwest and other areas and do these kinds of information sessions to try and promote the idea. Well, is there skepticism on the part of developers? Oh, nobody in Montana would want to do this. If they knew, I mean, I know the markets there. Everybody I know wants to sell their house in South Hills and move to town, which would, of course, crash the private housing market if we all did it at once. But if they knew there were buyers, uh, that people would do it, would it help? Because Missoula's pretty good at organizing things. We need to know that it will pay off. Um, probably. probably. We, we've never found a lack of market yeah. being the deterrent. Okay. Uh, it's been more just trying to get the developers interested in the concept. Okay. And, and I think one of the challenges is this two to three year process. Yeah. You know, that you have, you have to be very involved in the marketing right. side to keep people interested and, and, and participated in the project. And if you do that, I mean, it works. I mean, th yeah. these five developers I'm talking about back in the Midwest, that's what they do. I mean, they start with a reservation list and then they start having, you know, they have these meetings at least once a month to bring people in, existing signups and new people, keep it going. And then as it progresses, they start having lunches or whatever to keep people up to date. Uh, once they get into the purchasing mode, they carry it to that next step. But it's constant communication, discussion, interaction with the potential buyers to keep them interested and to keep them up to date on what's going on. You have a question? Uh, yeah, uh, in Missoula, we don't live in Missoula now, we have family here, we used to live here in the uh, uh, late 70s, early 80s, but uh, I know in Missoula there's about as many dogs as there is bicycles. Uh, didn't say anything in here about pets. Is that up to the association, basically? Uh, basically it is. Uh, two things with cooperatives today, uh, all cooperatives, uh, gone to no smoking building and grounds. Uh, they used to permit smoking and then they went to uh, no smoking in the building and now they've gone to no smoking anywhere on the grounds or the building. Pets are permitted. They usually have uh, limits like one or two dogs or one or two cats and size limits on dogs. 25, 30 or 35 pounds, whatever uh, for that. But that's pretty much universal? No. Oh, okay. No. Um, it depends on the developer. Uh, most developers uh, permit that. Once the cooperative gets up and running, it can be all over the board. Mm -hmm. uh, we just had our annual senior cooperative housing conference last week, 275 uh, registrants, half of them members at a uh, co-op. There are a couple of co-ops that have policies of absolutely no pets, period. Uh, and they have members who have moved in there because of that and had allergies. Sure. Now they're dealing with the issue of companion pets. Right. Yeah. How do you handle that? So that's become quite an issue in some of these co-ops in Minnesota. We have co-ops that have permitted pets, they've gone to forbidding pets, and are now back to permitting pets. <laughs> uh, so this one is all over the board, but it depends on what the members want to do. Just a question, chicken and the egg, is if the developer comes on and then the cooperative is formed, or can it go the other way? Can a cooperative be formed? And solicitor and developer comes out. Yeah, is it? it? It's generally the other, it's generally the developer and then the cooperative form because the developer provides the interim board of directors sure. uh, for the cooperative. And unless you have a developer who's willing to begin this process and pursue it, there's really no advantage in creating a cooperative. Did you have a question there? Did I answer? Uh, I, the only thing that I know of that's really like 400 units, there's a real estate agency in Missoula that's, that's planning to build a 400 unit down by the river and, and have all the exercise and the meeting rooms and everything, but they plan to rent it to university students. Oh, student housing, oh, student housing. Yeah. Yep. yeah. Yep. It's not student housing. It's, well, no, it, it's apartments, but geared towards yeah. students, university yeah. students. Yeah. I have one of them about a quarter of a mile from my house in Arden Hills. It's called E Flats, or E Street Flats. But it's geared towards students at the University of Minnesota, Bethel, and the University of Northwest. Yeah. One, one to studios to three bedroom units, I think. It's all geared with kind of a central living area and then bedrooms off.
zu sein. Yes. I, I think yeah, this woman mentioned about location. Yeah. I think for many of us who have lived in the center of Missoula, <laughs> we don't want to lose that nice. central Why we live here? sense and to move out to Reserve Street or beyond what used to be farmland just does not seem like home. It doesn't seem like the kind of community. There's so much down, downtown. There's so much at the university to partake yeah. of. Yeah. Those are the kinds of things, along with views and, and all those things that we, that at our station life we value. And I think that that thing. often is, is the sticking point for yes. of someone saying, yes, I want to do it. Or no, that's not for me because yeah. it's too far away. Yeah. There's a lot of land on the area around um, Wyoming Street. I wouldn't even really consider it. No, that's yeah. not downtown. Yeah, I, I'm not sure what land is available. Bill and I were talking about that earlier. But you're right in terms of the, you know, the question we asked in the survey is what influenced you to move into the cooperative? The number one and number two answer were location mm -hmm. and no maintenance. Mm -hmm. And I think that's exactly, yeah, exactly right. One way cities solve the problem of location is they build up. That is not a Montana ethic. But it is one way to solve the use of land. And I noticed you have wonderful, like, two, three or four story units. They look right. like they'd be perfect here. Has anybody managed to build a cooperative that had more floors and therefore could be built on a smaller part? 7,500 yards. That's 10 stories high. Okay. That was the first one. You know, that went uh, uh, 10 stories. I, I mean, what that one did was, as the first one was remarkable, number one was 338 units. Wow. You know, 10 stories high. Uh, most of them today are around 70 to 75 units in the, in the larger populations. Uh, rural areas are down to around 30 to 40 uh, units or maybe up to 50. Um, there's two others, I think, of those 104 that are more than five-story buildings. Otherwise, they're all generally a three to four-story buildings. The Senior Citizen Center, where it's at now, is going to be moving. Yes, it's right. Pat, Pat would be wonderful. Today about that. How about Higgins? That's an entire block. Yeah. We'd be fine with that. Wonderful. You want to sign us up? Just tell us. Just get us downtown. Other questions or comments? Well, if you have any, my information is on the back of that uh, brochure. Uh, and our uh, office number is on there as well. Uh, we have two websites, SeniorCoopLiving.org, that has a lot of the brochure information, and a video is also on that website, if you wish uh, to watch it on the uh, website. Do you know who's coming tomorrow? I know you've invited No, we don't, no. we don't have any idea who's coming. We just left an open invitation. <coughs> and what's the other website? SeniorCoops.org. That's our, our direct foundation website, and both of these websites have uh, housing directories on there, which lists all of those existing 104 senior housing cooperatives and uh, and where they're located, uh, addresses, and their websites. If you're interested in looking at any of them. No, I'm out of St. Paul, Minnesota. No. Bellevue. Closest location. That yeah, Bellevue is the uh, silver diamond. Long ways away from Yeah, that's true. <laughs> that's as close as Spokane. As it is. That's what it should be. Anything else? Well, where we go from here, if you're interested, you're asked to fill out those forms and to leave them at the desk. And we'll uh, see what comes out of the meeting with the, uh, with the developers tomorrow and with others, and uh, we'll keep you posted. Thanks for being here. Bill, do you have any other comments? Thank you. I guess not. Thanks for being here.